Hello, and welcome to today's noon conference, co-sponsored by MRI Online and AAWR. The AAWR was founded in 1981 to provide a forum for issues unique to women in radiology, radiation oncology, and related professions. The association sponsors programs that promote opportunities for women and facilitates networking among members and other professionals. As well, AAWR strives to meet the diverse and changing needs of its members through mentorship opportunities for the next generation of women radiologists. You can learn more about their mission and membership at aawr.org. We are thrilled to partner with them on these lectures and committed to advancing and supporting women in radiology as part of our mission to transform the way radiologists learn and thrive. You can access the recording of today's lecture and previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership and get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Mylon Ho for a lecture on the lymphatic system, anatomy, physiology, and imaging. Dr. Ho is a professor of radiology and an international physician leader, scientist, and educator who specializes in translational advanced imaging and precision health. Dr. Ho trained in chemical engineering at Stanford and MIT, medicine at Washington University, radiology at BIDMC Harvard, and neuroradiology at UCSF. Her books include Neuro Neuroradiology Signs, The AAW Pocket Mentor, and Pediatric Neuroimaging, State of the Art. At the end of the lecture, join Dr. Ho in a Q&A session where she will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we are ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Ho, please take it from here. So thank you everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking about the glymphatic system, which is a fairly uh, newly described entity just in the last decade, uh, responsible for brain homeostasis and a lot of disease processes as well. So I'm gonna try to provide a broad overview of the neuroanatomy, neurobiology, uh, physiologic implications and variation, and then how we're interrogating this very interesting system with imaging over the next hour. All right, so these are my grants, nothing related to this talk. I'd like to acknowledge several um, physicists that I work with at different institutions who have been very helpful in um, collaborations. All right, so today we will be reviewing glymphatic system structure and function. What is it? What does it do? What are the clinical implications for brain health, for brain disease, and for interventional therapies? And then we will discuss emerging and current imaging techniques that are relevant to neurofluid circulation and dynamics. So I'm going to start very big picture. You know, what are the contents of the cranial vault, right? We have neurons, which are the nerve cells. We have glia, which are the supporting cells, which help with maintenance and regulation and so forth. We have the vessels, right? This is the Monroe Kelly doctrine, essentially. Uh, so we have the arteries, veins, and capillaries. And then we have everything else, which is the interstitial space, right? And we don't really think about this. It's almost like a negative space. It's really everything, everything else, the fluid and the extracellular space beyond. And so that's what we're really going to magnify on in this talk. So when we look at neural cells, as I mentioned, there are neurons. And so essentially these consist of dendrites that collect incoming signals. They conduct that to the cell body, which processes them and then sends out, um, you know, transmits new uh, sig outgoing signals through the axon, which in mature children and adults is myelinated, right? So we have fat and protein that enable saltatory or skip conduction to make this faster. Um, and then they synapse either to another neuron or an effector cell, like a nerve or a muscle. Then we also have a lot of uh, glial cells or supporting cells, right? So in this uh, central nervous system, we have astrocytes, which have many different functions. They help with uh, nerve development, nerve regulation, uh, vessel uh, responses, response to injury, right? So gliosis, astrogliosis. Uh, we also have oligodendrocytes. So these are the ones that actually uh, create myelin. They wrap around the axons and help myelinate uh, with age. Uh, there are microglia, which are responsible for immune presentation, macrophage reaction. And then the ependymal cells, which are, you know, kind of lining the, the ventricles and the central canal of the spinal cord and, and helping with that uh, CSF barrier. 
And then in the peripheral nervous system, uh, the analogs of the astrocytes are the satellite cells, so they have a lot of different supportive functions. And then the Schwann cells are like the oligodendrocytes, so they myelinate the peripheral nerves. Okay, so when we look at the vessels, it's fairly simple, right? So we have the large arteries, like the carotid uh, vertebral arteries, the circle of Willis, and they branch in the arterioles. And then at the level of the capillaries, this is where all the gas exchange happens, oxygen and carbon dioxide. And then the capillaries, you know, reconverge into small venules and then draining veins. And so that seems very simple, right? But in everywhere else in the body, but the central nervous system, the capillaries are leaky. And so in, ex in addition to the oxygen exchange, they are able to um, leak these wastes into the interstitium and then the lymphatic system, right? The peripheral lymphatic system actually collects those wastes and drains them. Uh, to the venous system, ultimately. Uh, however, in the brain, there are actually capillary tight junctions, part of the blood-brain barrier, which do not allow that leakage to happen, right? And so that's why you don't, um, this basically helps the brain to be a sanctuary site so that you're not exposed to, you know, drugs or toxins or pathogens in the blood that enter the CNS, you know, without a lot of resistance. The problem is from that, if you have that blood-brain barrier that's very tight, how are you actually getting the nutrients, you know, the macromolecules or the, even at the small molecules um, into the brain parenchyma and how are you draining waste? So that was a critical question that was actually not answered until the last decade or so. So when you think about that a little bit. Okay, so in the brain, we have many fluid compartments, right? We all know about the cerebrospinal fluid. It is produced at the level of the cord plexi in the ventricular system. So we have your lateral ventricles, they drain through the framework of Monroe to the midline third ventricle, and then down through the superal aqueduct of the fourth ventricle, and then into the Freeman magnum. And then a lot of that, about 80% of the um, CSF then kind of comes up the cerebral convexities and is resorbed by various mechanisms, right? And then maybe 20% or so comes down through the spinal canal and coats the cord in the central canal and so forth. So that's uh, the CSF, right? Um, that's 10% of all of your um, fluid um, in, the, in the cranial vault. Then you have the, um, the blood, right? So we have uh, water in the blood as well. So the arteries, the veins, the capillaries circulating. And then the rest of the fluid, right? So a good amount of it in the brain is within the, the neural cell. So both the neuro and, and neurons and the glia, right? They have cell bodies. They have all this like fluid within, you know, encapsulated in the cell memories and all of this. However, there's still some fluid unaccounted for as I mentioned, the negative space, right? That's the interstitial fluid. And that's everything else. So it's between the neuroglia and the vessels. It's all of this interstitial extracellular space, you know, um, all of this other stuff that when added up constitutes about 12% of the total volume. All right. So when we look at neurofluid circulation, the female Danish scientist, Maiken Nedergaard, who works part-time at the University of Rochester, actually discovered this in rodents in 2012. And she named it the glymphatic system, which is short for glial plus lymphatic, because it serves the function of the peripheral lymphatics in the CNS, which you know doesn't have the normal lymphatics. So there are some dural lymphatics, but the glia, the supporting glial cells play a really critical role in uh, communicating with the peripheral and dural lymphatics. And so those processes together essentially accomplish exchange between the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain and the interstitial fluid surrounding in those, you know, paravascular spaces. And so that process is very complex and we'll get more into it in a second, but that enables brain nutrition, it enables waste clearance and various, you know, dynamics and mechanics. The mechanical processes involve dispersion, which is really a combination of advection. So not convection because that's temperature changes, but advection, which is bulk flow due to velocity changes, as well as diffusion, which we see all the time across membranes, more with small molecules than large, but it's really a combination of bulk flow and diffusion. And so as a reminder, the peripheral lymphatics are very leaky. And so they can communicate, you know, with the capillaries and drain um, waste, but in the brain, you have these tight junctions. And so, uh, you know, there are all these supporting glial cells in that paravascular space that assist with this exchange process. So it does not happen in the same way as the periphery. And this is really important because it allows the CNS to be really a very stereotyped environment, you know, very 
consistent homeostatic environment, but very different from the rest of the body because the CNS has to regulate many peripheral functions, right? It has to communicate with the cardiovascular system, the gastrointestinal system, and then the immune system. And it has to do all of those things in different ways and yet maintain its own homeostasis at the same time. So here's another nice little example. So, you know, going back to, you know, physical chemistry or whatever, but uh, the, the um, plasma membrane, the cell membrane is nonpolar, right? So small little molecules, like if they're very small, they can diffuse quickly and go through membranes and stuff if they're nonpolar. Um, so diffusion properties can happen with small nonpolar molecules, but very rarely with larger polar molecules, right? They're just not going to go through. So uh, that process happens with bulk flow. So you know, the cardiac cycle, like pumping the blood through, pumping the CSF pulsations, that really helps a lot with both small and large molecules. All right, so now I'm going to get to barrier systems. So we always talk about blood-brain barrier, but there are actually many other barriers as well. So I'm going to talk about each one in a little bit of detail. So the, the word barrier is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not a, tr it's not a complete, you know, bar like impenetrable barrier, but it's a semi-permeable interface, right? And the idea is to selectively regulate the neural environment so that you can have different compartments with different functions and microenvironments. And so the blood-brain barrier, as I mentioned, is at the level of the vasculature and the perivascular space. So you have these tight capillary junctions, which restrict exchange of fluids and other um, you know, molecules between the blood and the rest of the brain. You also have a blood CSF barrier. That's the choroid plexus, right? Because the choroid plexus is a highly vascular organ that uh, produces CSF and is the only place where blood and CSF actually directly contact each other. And so it's a very intimately um, kind of convoluted epithelial endothelial convolute that has uh, very unique functions in terms of specialized um, specialized um, epider um, epidermal cells. And uh, then you have brain CSF barriers, right? So there's both outer and inner. So the outer barrier between the brain and the CSF is the leptomeninges, right? The pia matter, arachnoid matter. Um, that's the basement membrane. And then the inner CSF brain barrier is the ventricular ependymer, right? So the lining of the ventricles, which really restricts, you know, the CSF from actually getting into um, the parenchyma under normal circumstances, you know, changes in hydrocephalus and so forth. But okay, so here, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. So here's another um, kind of summary of what's happening with these four different brain barriers, right? So the outer meningeal barrier, where you have um, the leptomeninges, a bunch of supporting cells, and then uh, the reactinoid granulations and all that are at the periphery. You have the inner blood. Um, blood CSF barrier, which is the cord plexus, right? Uh, producing all of this uh, fluid and having the um, blood right next to it. The ventricular barrier, which is the ependymal cells of the ventricles abutting the CSF in the brain on each side. And then our favorite, the blood brain barrier, where um, we're going to talk more about this, but essentially you have tight junctions and then you have pericytes right around the capillary wall, modulating it. And then you have astrocyte foot processes that are actually um, sitting there and uh, sitting on the surface of that complex and regulating the exchange process, the fluid exchange. Okay, so let's drill down more into this blood-brain barrier. That, this is what Mike and Nedegaard looked at with the rodents. And so this has been determined to be uh, closely regulated by aquaporin-4 water channels. So aquaporin-4 uh, channels are essentially, they provide selective osmosis, right? Uh, they're embedded in the cell membrane. And most of them live in the kidney with all these collecting tubules and stuff. But the aquaporin-4 you see throughout the body. Um, and you also see that with, for example, neuromyelitis optica, right? The autoimmune disorder uh, with a lot of water dysregulation. So aquaporin-4 channels play a critical role in here. And so now I want to get into... Uh, the astrocytes and the pericytes. So the pericytes are the glia that directly modulate the vessel constriction, the wall, you know, and the astrocyte foot processes actually coordinate everything between and surround this complex and regulate the fluid exchange. So there's a perivascular space, the so-called vercal robin spaces, right? They're extensions of the subarachnoid space that go into the brain. And that's the blue right here, this kind of light blue color. And in fact, Vercarobin, and at imaging, we, we typically describe the periarterial spaces that, you know, the, the subarachnoid spaces surrounding the penetrating arteries. But in fact, there are also paravenous spaces, and they're contiguous. The, 
We don't know if there's a pericapillary space. It hasn't been described yet. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist because the thing is the capillaries are eight to 10 microns. So it could be that they're just so small, we're not resolving them yet. So they'd be a micron or less. Uh, or it could be that they're um, you know, permeable because that's where the exchange is happening. So we don't know yet. So no one knows if there is or isn't a pericapillary space for, for sure. Um, but there are definitely para, uh, periarterial and perivenous spaces. And then there's the paravascular space right next to the vessels. These are all these adjacent glial cells, the pericytes, the astrocytes, this interstitial space. And that's what does the bulk of the fluid exchange. So Nettergaard basically did fluorescent CSF tracer injection studies in rodents and saw this exchange process. So we always thought the Verkau robot spaces were doing the exchange, but they're actually, you know, kind of sealed, right, by the, by the membrane. So at the level of the capillaries, there's this exchange process that happens between the perivascular spaces and the paravascular spaces. And they see the tracer actually going out into the parenchyma. And that's basically where the wastes are getting cleared and the nutrients are getting delivered at that level of the capillaries. But it's really the paravascular space that does the majority of that work. Okay, so here's a little bit of a busy diagram, but it's a nice reflection of, of what I just said. So essentially you have the subarachnoid space, things go into the Verkauroban spaces in the arterial. And then we don't know what happens at the capillary space, but somehow, right, the um, exchange is happening between the CSF in these that's in the Verkauro band spaces and the interstitium regulated by these glial cells. And then everything drains back out into the paravenous spaces again along the CSF and then drains back out. Now, it, it may not be even as simple as unidirectional flow. So there's a lot of bulk flow kind of pushing this process forward, but there's even some studies suggesting that this is not purely like a forward process and it's really like everything is just exchanging in the interstitium and it may even be bi-directional you know just more forward than back but again there's a lot we still don't know about this it's very interesting very exciting very humbling as well all right so i wanted to mention there is a um there are some exceptions to blood brain barrier um where you actually have uh direct contact between uh certain structures and the blood and this is because, as I mentioned, the brain has to regulate the periphery, right? So it has to know what's going on in terms of the humoral, like the immunity and the endocrine stuff and all of that. And so these are called the circumventricular organs. Most of them live in and around the third and fourth ventricles in the midline, because that's where most of the flow happens. So there's this term AV3V. It's basically anteroventral third ventricle. So that's like where most of these guys live, right? Um, and they're highly exposed to blood circulation and CSF, so they can really help regulate a lot of endocrine and immune type uh, reactions. So they have fenestrated capillaries, highly permeable capillaries, so that they can actually, you know, see what's going on in the periphery, right? Um, so like the pituitary, the pineal, pineal gland, why do they all enhance, right? Because they don't have an intact blood-brain barrier there. That's normal. Um, the tanny sites and the hypothalamus have specialized ependema, so they have neural projections as well. So the circumventricular organs are CVOs consist of sensory ones. So the area prostrema is one of the most well-known, right? And the roof of the fourth ventricle that causes vomiting, right? And some disorders. Actually, NMO classically has area prostrema lesions and has um, vomiting. Uh, the, there's an organ uh, below the fornix. Uh, there's one in the lamina terminalis of the hypothalamus. Uh, there's also secretory organs, right? So these are actually secreting like um, hormones and stuff to the periphery. So there's, um, there's one in uh, the posterior commissure, obviously uh, the pituitary uh, has a lot of them, uh, the median eminence of the hypothalamus and then the pineal gland. So some are sensory, uh, some are secretory, some are sensory, some are both. Uh, but the idea is that they, they actually are exceptions to that blood-brain barrier for specific communication with the periphery. Okay, so now let's drill down into the other barriers. So we have the, the cord plexus, which forms the blood CSF barrier. As I mentioned, it's highly convoluted uh, fenestrated capillaries. So this is actually the only place in your brain that is permeable, um, normally permeable to macromolecules. So this is why when you're doing some of these gene therapies or large molecule therapies, they actually will put in a ventricular catheter and inject directly because you just can bypass all the other barriers and inject these large molecules and they can get absorbed by the cord plexus. So that's the most effective rather than trying to disrupt the blood brain barrier. Um, and they also produce a CSF. So uh, the two CSF and brain barriers, the inner and the outer, right? So again, here's the cord plexus. The inner barrier here is the ventricular penema. So there are gap junctions between cells that are uh, tight, so they restrict, um, restrict passage. But there are also strap junctions, which selectively allow certain 
molecular sizes through between cells and not others. So it's pretty complex. And then the outer barrier, right, again, is the glial basement membrane. So there's like a basement membrane that restricts, um, restricts communication of, along the pyorectinoid mater and the brain. And that is actually disrupted in some things like Zika virus infection and um, some developmental things like cobblestone cortex, actually, uh, these muscular dystrophies. All right, so there's also extracranial barriers, right? So the orbit the eyes are actually extension of the CNS, right? And so there are, this is very well known in ophthalmology. It's talked about a lot in terms of drug delivery, right? Because it's very hard to get drugs into the eye, uh, gene therapies, you know, direct injection and stuff. And then if you have an eye infection, right? If you have endophthalmitis, it's very hard to get uh, antibiotics there. Uh, so there's a blood aqueous barrier in the front, right? In the anterior chamber. And that, uh, that restricts, um, you know, essentially toxins and infection to the ciliary body. Uh, out here. And then in the back, you know, um, uh, back here in the posterior part, uh, the, the majority of the globe, the vitreous chamber, you actually have two uh, blood retinal barriers. The inner barrier is the retinal vascular epithelium. So it has a lot of those like astrocytes, pericytes and stuff like we were talking about. And the outer barrier is the retinal pigment epithelium. So like the choroid, brook membrane, all of that like more tough stuff that is restricting uh, flow through the choriocapillaries. Uh, there's the blood labyrinth barrier, so the inner ear, right? Another area. So the stria vascularis in the scala media of the inner ear um, secretes um, endolymph, right? So there's perilymph, uh, which communicates with the CSF um, in the brain. And then there's endolymph, which is like, and that uh, difference in concentrations between those two actually enables the electric you know, signals um, that power your cochlear hair, hair cells. And you can transmit that into, essentially you can conduct that and transmit that into the perception of sound. So maintaining that difference in electric potential between endolymph and perilymph is very, very important. So inner ear is also another infamous place where you know it's hard to get drugs uh, when you have labyrinthitis and stuff. And people have done trans-tympanic injections, uh, Meniere disease, right, where you have endolymphatic high drops, right? Uh, there have been studies showing delayed gadolinium enhancement, or you can do trans-tympanic injections again, right, for that. So there are studies about that as well, but very similar or analogous kind of barrier. The blood spinal cord barrier. So basically the uh, barrier does come down through the cord. It's similar, like it's analogous with the pericytes and the astrocytes, but it's looser than the brain, right? So there's more susceptibility to disease, to injury. It's a little bit more permeable, which is why when we're trying to do a lot of the CNS therapies, you know, chemo, um, gene therapy, whatever, uh, we often will inject, like do an LP and then inject either at the level of the lumbar or sometimes like C12 punctures, but it's a little bit easier to, to access and deliver uh, to the level of the cord than within the brain. And then there's a blood nerve barrier. So even the peripheral nerves, like as they come out, right, there's the dorsal root ganglion, and then you have a, a nerve barrier, which again is even looser, right? But this is very important for people who are doing like peripheral nerve injections and stuff like that, that you have the epi, uh, the epineurium, the endoneurium, right? And so there, there is actually this interstitial space. And again, it is regulated by the pericytes um, and the endothelial cells. Okay, so the other thing I want to mention is CNS egress, right? So we have uh, this process of exchange modulated by the glymphatic system, but there are other pathways by which CNS can exit the brain, and they also kind of help support, you know, the waste clearance and so forth. So the arachnoid granulations, which we all know about and which we thought was doing this, we're doing this process, but actually is a more supplementary downstream role. So these are little um, uh, projections, right, of arachnoid mater into the dura mater, so they can actually abut the, the veins uh, running in the dura, the venous sinus directly and uh, help with more drainage. But that's only after the CSF interstitial exchange has happened in the pericapillary region. There are meningeal uh, lymphatics and dural spaces, particularly as I'll show you later along the parasagittal midline area of the brain. And those also help communicate with the um, peripheral lymphatics. They drain down through cervical lymphatics and then they go to the, like the SVC and the you know like thoracic duct uh, venous system. Um, as I mentioned, um, about 20% or so of CSF actually goes not into the, you know, through the brain, but actually goes down and coats the spinal cord, the central canal, uh, the peripheral nerves. Uh, and then there's also some exit via these neurovascular foramina, right, through your skull base and whatnot. So vascular adventitia also carry out a little bit of CSS, being those a minority. And so all of these uh, pathways end up 
draining the peripheral circulation, peripheral lymphatics, and provide additional CSF drainage and solute clearance capability. So to summarize the arachnoid granulations, which you know project into the dura and about the veins, here's those parasagal dural spaces. So they live kind of in and around the uh, superior sagittal sinus and so forth. I'll show you some MRI examples later um, around the cranial nerves um, and around the dural lymphatics. Um, and actually, um, very interestingly, there are quite a few um, nasal lymphatics in your, this has been recently described in your um, like a olfactory uh, groove, right, where all the nerves come down. So actually, uh, the CSF leaks, you can with like very kind of leaky, you can actually detect some of that coming out and, and image it as well, particularly at the level of the, you know, olfactory plate. All right. So we talk about this a lot in functional MRI, um, neurovascular coupling slash uncoupling, right? So it's really not the neurovascular unit, it's the neurogliovascular unit, right? So the NGVU. So we're, uh, we really are starting to understand the extremely central role that the glia, as I mentioned, the pericyte, you know, modulating the capillary, and then the astrocyte foot process really controlling that whole complex. That really enables the communication between the neuron, right? the capillary uh, slash vascular system and everything else. And so the NGVU is the, the single most, you know, basic structural and functional unit of the brain, right? And provides multi-level communication from molecular cellular all the way to like, you know, brain system wide. And so in a normal healthy brain, right? This enables cerebral autoregulation, the hemodynamic response, right? So in functional MRI, if you, let's say you, you know, move your hand, right? Then you're using more, uh, oxyhemoglobin, right? So the deoxyhemoglobin percentage increases, oxyhemoglobin drops. And then after five to 15 seconds, you have an autoregulatory response where the brain delivers more blood to that area. And you can see that as an increased signal, slightly increased on bold fMRI or ASL or any other perfusion study. Um, and so that's how you, that's how you know you have a healthy neuro, um, neuroglyovascular unit. Now, in, sh in some conditions, like let's say tumor, right, with neovascularity or you know, chronic brain injury or whatever, uh, you may actually have disruption of this of this normal signaling process, right? So that's neurovascular uncoupling. And so that's the idea that, you know, just because you're, let's say, moving your hand, but the motor cortex was injured or something or has a tumor, um, you may not actually get it to light up on fMRI because of the lack of the normal physiologic response. And that's a false negative fMRI. That's a situation where the... Um, it's not, it's not necessarily that there is no motor function there, but you're not actually sensing it at fMRI because the assumption you're making with bold fMRI is not valid, right? That you have a healthy NGVU. So this is very important, right? Because um, it really has a lot of implications for function and the glial cells really play a huge role in it. So in terms of the cell types involved, it's very complex. People are still doing a lot of research on this, but I mentioned the endothelial wall, the astrocytes and pericytes. Um, there are many different barrier types. So we usually talk about endothelial barriers, but there are epithelial, even mesothelial and glial barriers that we're seeing. So there's just a lot of work going on in cell biology. It's like extremely complex and many different kinds of transporter types too, right? So things embedded in the membranes, tight junctions, um, fence and gate functions. So both um, barriers at the level of the cell membrane and then between cells as well. All right. So now I want to get into physiology, right? So the thing is that the glymphatic system vary, the function varies a lot, even in normal individuals, right? So as you can imagine with cardiac cycle, right? Systole, diastole, with the uh, respiration, brain activity, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're active with your brain or you're or not, uh, the body position, sitting, standing, you know, uh, exercise, right? Physical activity, diet, lifestyle, all of these actually impact glymphatic function quite a bit. And there have been studies on each one of these um, individually. Uh, sleep is a huge one, right? So this is what made the news, you know, in the last decade, right? That in the rats that she was looking at, um, the in the interstitial space, right? That was be essentially the drainage, it increased 60% in volume. So essentially, glymphatic function more than doubled uh, in these rats during sleep. So essentially, you know, if you're not getting your sleep, you're not clearing your waste, right? So your, your brain waste are building up and building up. Um, and I had written an editorial for AWR slash ASNR talking about some of the history in terms of, you know, the, you hear about these video gamers who die in their chairs after playing for three, two or three days straight, uh, or in Japan, death from overwork is like a thing, right? So they just, they keep working and they're like, oh, I'm working, I'm drinking coffee, I'm good. And then suddenly they just drop dead. And it's actually a well-known phenomenon. Um, so, you know, sleep is important, right? If you take one thing from this talk, uh, the circadian rhythm. So most, um, most mammals and even many plants, right, have like a diurnal rhythm. So like the day and the night. And so 
the glymphatic functions, you know, um, changes, right. Depending on, on when they're awake and asleep, uh, other lifestyle things. So exercise stress is, you know, a big problem, drugs, you know, things like caffeine, right. Um, or, you know, recreational drugs and aging. So over the course of our lives, even for a very healthy, normal person, right. The glymphatic system, uh, degenerates like, like everything else. All right. So normal is a relative term. Okay, so I wanted to show you uh, just some examples uh, or some schematics, right? So basically the glymphatic system, so uh, when it's active versus inactive, right? So basically aquaporin-4 channels will restrict uh, fluid exchange, let's say when you're awake and you're busy or you're stressed or whatever you're doing. And then when you're sleeping, right, and, and you have the ability to exchange these ways. So uh, it's kind of a dynamic thing, right? So at some times when when you're not busy doing something else and you have the, you know, uh, there's more downtime, shall we say, right? Then the glymphatic system is more active. And all of these different modulators, right? The cardiac cycle, the respiratory cycle, a neural activity, awake, asleep, thinking, not thinking as much, right? And the vasodynamics, all of these things, as you can see from how I described the physiology earlier, are going to have a big impact. Okay, so... You know, this is a hot topic, and actually people have linked glymphatic system to pretty much everything in their mother, right, in terms of neurologic diseases. It's like, oh, the glymphatic system is responsible for everything. And I think it's true in a way that ever that it is, it is a biomarker, which may be either direct or indirect, right? So we know that every neurologic disease has been linked to disturbance of glymphatic function. The problem is this is a chicken or the egg, because even in a normal, you know, normal individual, we see so much variation. So where's the threshold for calling disease? And then if you, let's say, there's a lot of work looking at, for example, sleep and lifestyle interventions in Parkinson's disease. Um, is the disordered sleep a symptom or is it a cause, right? And, or, and if, you, if you essentially do sleep rehab, do they actually have better outcomes? So there's a lot of questions we still don't understand. And then how do you, how, where's the cut point diagnostically, right? And, and therapeutically between normal and disease? That, there's a lot of unanswered questions here from a practical, you know, clinical standpoint. But uh, there have been papers linking disordered glymphatic function, you know, uh, impaired waist clearance to disorders of CSF pressure, not surprisingly, right? So hydrocephalus, um, CSF hypertension, CSF hypotension, uh, strokes and vasculopathies, right? All sorts of, you know, ischemias and strokes and uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, infection autoimmune. So I mentioned neuromyelitis optica because of the aquaporin 4, but all sorts of different you know, CNS infections that break down the blood-brain barrier, autoimmune disorders, right? Um, Post-traumatic uh, brain injury, the response to the recovery from uh, pain disorders, right? The perception of pain, uh, metabolic and toxic disorders, right? Obviously, you know, how does how do these toxins affect the CNS? Why do some people respond, you know, more adversely than others? Um, even during development, right? There's a lot we don't know because a lot of this work has been done in like adult or mature animal models or humans, right? So how does how does glymphatic function evolve? And we know it's not matured birth, right? So over the first several years of life, these barriers develop and progress. So there are a lot of implications for neurodevelopmental disorders and the their inverse neurodegenerative disorders. Quite a bit of work done in the dementias for this, as well as neuropsychiatric, you know, mood disorders, uh, personality disorders, et cetera. So there's a nice little summary article in the Japan uh, Journal, uh, which calls these all glymphedema, right? Because the idea is that the glymphatic system doesn't work. So the fluid, the, you know, the waste laden fluid builds up. And so the idea is it's a common pathway because it could be anything like maybe you're not sleeping enough. Maybe you had a trauma, maybe you had old hemorrhage, you have issues with your membranes, your barriers, right? You have some underlying vascular issues, you have inflammation or something else. Whatever the initial primary insult, right? It leads to secondary neural injury. It impairs the interstitial fluid exchange. And essentially what happens is the waste proteins build up, they build up, it's like a positive feedback. And so there's a final common pathway of glymphedema where you get essentially irreversible neural damage. So some examples. So these are all different etiologies, right? So an acute stroke, right? So you get uh, like cytotoxic edema, and then you get impaired drainage of fluid because everything's swollen. Acute hemorrhage, where because of the fibrin from the red blood cells, your you know, aquaporin uh, transporters are blocked and you can't drain. Traumatic brain injury, where you have all sorts of like inflammatory, you know, like disruptions and stuff. And so like the drainage is impaired. Or chronic things, normal aging, right? Where the aquaporin four cells, um, sorry, uh, transporters are now mislocalized and they don't work right. Uh, the dimensions where you have 
uh, you know, amyloid beta or alpha synuclein or whatever, impairing the drainage, you know, because of these plaques and things that are, are accumulating in the cells or hydrocephalus where you have, you know, altered CSF pressures and differentials and now you can't drain. So you can see these are all different molecular mechanisms, but they have that common, um, you know, common pathway in terms of you can't drain correctly, waste accumulates. So the amyloid beta, right? It's not unique to AD, right? You can see it in any of these things, right? So the whole point is these are common pathway waste products. And once they're there, they just keep building up and it's a positive feedback and you can't drain, you get more waste and then your, your brain is damaged. But all sorts of different acute and chronic insults and even normal physiologic aging could lead to that common pathway. It's just a matter of like how fast, right? And how severe. Okay, so... I just did this PubMed again this morning because it's always this number is always increasing. But there have been almost 1,200 papers, you know, um, on the lymphatic system since in the last decade, and over a quarter of those in the last six months. It's a very hot topic, you know, very huge area of interest. I hope to stimulate more interest through talks like this. Uh, a lot of this, I think, is being done in the kind of basic science side and even some of the imaging physics, but less so in the clinical because, as I mentioned, there are a lot of questions about clinical applications, clinical practicability. But I think a deeper understanding of that translation from bench to bedside is really key for us as radiologists and referring physicians to really sort of re rethink how we've approached a lot of neurological diseases and therapies. And so I just wanted to point that out. Um, so these are just some of the you know best and greatest uh, articles on the topics I just talked about. So like, um, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, um, immune diseases uh, uh, and drugs, you know, cocaine, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So um, there, there's, on every topic I just mentioned, there's tons of papers that you can look at if you would like, but I've kind of looked at many of them already and I've tried to synthesize it for you so you didn't have to. <laughs> All right. So then the, the last part is really diagnosis and therapy, right? So I wanted to mention that, you know, understanding of the blood-brain barrier and other CNS barriers is actually very important, right? For our understanding of intervention, right? Uh, it could be as minimally invasive as lifestyle, right? So we talked about, you know, sleep rehab and diet and things, and, and how does that affect the natural course of the disease? But of course, drug delivery, right? So CNS drug delivery is, um, you know, infamously difficult, right? And so we can do things like the ventricular access device, but, you know, there's a risk of infection. These things clog after a while. It's very invasive, right? So are there ways to deliver things to the periphery, but then still get them through the blood-brain barrier? You know, or can we modulate? Let's say if we do a surgery, we do an ablation, or even, you know, adjuvant therapies, how can we improve the effectiveness of these, you know, targeted treatments? So there's a lot of work being done, for example, with a focus ultrasound, because like mannitol, right? It translately disrupts the blood-brain barrier, but only translately, right? So if you actually want to deliver something to the, through the blood-brain barrier to the CNS, you can do a focus ultrasound and then, you know, the intervention or the drug delivery or whatever. Uh, there's all sorts of other things like, you know, nano nanoparticles and how does this, how can you modulate um, or how can you do minimally invasive interventions and so forth. But I just wanted to provide some awareness of that because the more we understand about how this process works normally and how it's disrupted by disease, we can also selectively disrupt or target these things to really improve the effectiveness of the existing therapies or developing therapies that we have. All right, so uh, last part is imaging techniques, which is what maybe you're all here for since it's an MRI lecture. And so there are many different uh, new and emerging technologies that can be used to interrogate different aspects of neurofluid circulation and lymphatic system. So there's structure, there's flow and there's metabolism, right? So structure, obviously the higher field imaging, right? High performance gradients will give you really nice microstructures. So uh, 17 has been used a lot, particularly for looking at perivascular spaces. You can see them in very, you know, small resolution. Uh, diffusion type, uh, diffusion plus uh, approaches can look at the directionality, you know, of flow within and around the perivascular spaces and then a susceptibility to actually see the traversing vessels. And you can do some of these in, in concert to actually correlate between the different you know, structural findings. In terms of flow, we have non-contrast uh, you know, perfusion, which is our sure spin labeling. Um, we can also do face contrast or bold, more for fMRI, but there's actually an ultra fast bold that can be done as well uh, to look at glymphatic um, you know, pulsations. Uh, you can do GAD, right? But obviously there's, there's some, you know, like 
are you going to do that for research, right? Are you going to actually give someone GAD for research, especially if it might deposit long-term in the body? Well, you know, but there are studies that have been done, right? Just uh, in normal, you know, in patients coming through where you look at over time, like, you know, one hour, three hours, 24 hours, and you're looking at where, where these, uh, where the GAD goes as it partitions out from the intravascular to the interstitial space, right? So that's actually a, a very nice demonstration of the partitioning um, and the exchange process. So you can do intravenous GAD, but you can also inject intrathecal GAD, you know, intracisternal GAD, right, like around C12, um, or even internodal to look at, you know, lymphatic type, you know, lymphatic uh, drainage. And then we have, uh, you know, dynamic, uh, you know, either T2 star weighted or T1 weighted to look at, you know, over time, like how, you know, if you want to actually quantify that exchange process. And then metabolic wise, right, we have chemical change saturation transfer, which is an MRI technique, right, to look at different um, different uh, solutes that exchange with free water. And you can look at the concentrations of various things like uh, peptides or whatnot. Um, we have beyond proton MRI, right? We can do other nuclei imaging to look at metabolism or, or other types of cell processes. And then we've, of course, we have nuclear medicine techniques as well. Again, for research only, right? It's hard to justify like giving GAD or, you know, doing a radiopharmaceutical injection. But if you're doing this as part of like a clinical trial or like in part of patient care, right? We do, uh, we do sometimes do these, but it just depends on what the use case is. Here are the challenges, right? So as I mentioned, the glymphatic function is a multi-scale process. It's like everything from molecular cellular all the way to, you know, um, organs and tissues. Um, and so there's no one imaging uh, modality that will look at every scale, right? You can have things like histology or like, you know, um, single, whatever, like two photon microscopy. And that looks at like really small stuff, but then you're going to be doing ex vivo, right? Like little like pathologic specimens, you know, after the animal sacrifice and you can do humans like that. So in humans, right, we're looking more at macro scale stuff. Um, another, other problems, right, is that um, even with that, like even with 7T, right? You can try to get to microscopic or mesoscopic resolution, but you also have to have good temporal resolution. Usually spatial and temporal resolution imaging, as you know, are trade-offs, right? So looking at both very rapid temporal dynamics as well as high spatial resolution is quite challenging. And, you know, things like PET are, are, are not going to be good spatial resolution. And then finally, how do you get contrast into the interstitial space, right? Because you're looking at the exchange between CSF and interstitial. So you cannot directly inject the interstitial space. So you have to access one of these other spaces and then watch the exchange over time and be able to resolve that using imaging. So it is very challenging. That being said, we do have a lot of uh, emerging techniques. Um, so as you can see, it depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to image the blood compartment, the CSF or the interstitial space? Do you wanna give a tracer or not? You know, what sort of, uh, you know, do you want to use like phase contrast or diffusion technology? There's all these different possibilities. And physicists actually are doing a whole bunch of different stuff on this. So I think we should get on board and try to look at these things as well. Um, so, and then what part of the CNS are you looking at, right? Are you looking at kind of the perivascular exchange, um, you know, in the parenchyma? Are you looking at interstitial fluid transport, bulk flow, right? We do a lot of phase contrast, like CSF flow studies. You want to look at the efflux from the olfactory, you know, plate. You're going to look down here at the spine. Uh, you want to do this ultra fast, bold sequence that can actually look at pulsations of the entire brain. Um, you want to look at bulk flow in the spine. So there, for every single use case, there are, are at least one, if not multiple approaches. It just depends on what your clinical question is and what your disease process, and then really defining you know, the patient population and how you're going to approach this. All right. So as we all know, we've all seen these cases, right? CSF flow, Chiari 1, where you have impaired you know, flow at the level of the Craniocervical junction, you can have you know interstitial tonsillar pulsatility. Um, so Chiari one, Chiari two, um, aqueductal stenosis. Here's a nice example where you know the flow is not getting through the level of the aqueduct, so we're getting uh, proximal hydrocephalus. Um, and then you know post third ventriculostomy, looking at the success of you know flow through the floor of third ventricle and the membrane of liliquis. So we all know CSF flow studies, phase contrast studies, um, perivascular spaces, right? So. Um, at 7T, I mean, even at 3T, you can see these, but 7T, they've actually done some machine learning and deep learning approaches to try to auto-segment all these perivascular spaces and then sum them up, right, to look at total volume and also the, um, the average diameter, the average torch velocity. So they've been able to correlate, you know, the perivascular space volume, burden, torch velocity, length, et cetera, with um, normal aging, you know, what age, as well as disease processes like AD, AD severity. So obviously, you know, this is not the kind of thing where we're going to sit here and measure these ourselves, but having some sort of automated process could be helpful for PVS burden. All right. 
this is a actually a very straightforward way to look at um, perivascular space index. It's called the ALPS or the Along the Perivascular Spaces Index. And it's very simple. So essentially you take your run of the mill DTI, right? And this is the FA map, right? So you have the red is the, you know, left, right decussations. Uh, blue is the, you know, cortical spinal tract as it's going superior fear. And then um, AP is, is the um, green, right? So like the, you know, superior longitudinal fasciculus. So they basically said, okay, at the level of the centrum semio valley, right? You have these perivascular spaces that are kind of going in this X direction, right? Like this. And so you can distinguish these areas of interest, the cortical spinal tract, which is like a vertical projection, the um, association area, like the SLF, which is going anterior posterior, and the subcortical association, which is kind of going along the perivascular spaces. And so if you were to divide, right, um, the, the essentially the average flow, like diffusional flow along the perivascular spaces from the other two areas, right? There should be like essentially all the flow, all the CSF flow should be going along the perivascular spaces and not perpendicular. And there should be no real uh, difference between uh, these two unless it's the contribution of this paravascular exchange. So essentially they're saying, you know, there, there's this selective diffusion along the perivascular space. How does it really differentiate from, you know, how, how does that paravascular exchange process actually affect this flow? So it's really, what is that relationship? You know, how, how much flow is there that's actually being exchanged? Because there's no way it's actually going to go through, you know, through, um, through the axon or perpendicular to the axon unless you have an active glymphatic process going on to facilitate that exchange, right? It doesn't make any sense. So basically, you know, how much of this assumed perivascular flow is now being um, supplemented by the exchange essentially in the perpendicular direction? So it's a very simple, reproducible, easy for a clinician to measure even metric, just doing these ROIs. And essentially you average, you know, you average the two um, X, um, the two X measurements from the Y and Z. And that can be easily done at the workstation. It's pretty reproducible. And uh, there have been some nice studies. I'm actually reviewing a couple now on different disease processes, like temporal lobe epilepsy, the ALPS index, once the affected side versus unaffected, or like different stages of Alzheimer or things like that. All right. Um, there's also MR um, elastography, right? So brain MR elastography, which is essentially looking at tissue stiffness. And what I wanted to point out here was that uh, when you look at uh, like a normal H match control, if you look at different types of hydrocephalus, it could be communicating, it could be obstructive, whatever, but essentially you have increased um, interstitial pressures and that's forcing out the fluid from the perivascular spaces. So the remaining brain tissue actually looks stiffer than a normal patient in these various types of hydrocephalus. And so again, that has implications, right, for the effectiveness of the drainage, the fact that there's less interstitial fluid on board to be exchanged. Um, perfusion. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have Archer's Fin Labeling, which actually looks at uh, endogenous blood water as a tracer, and so you can actually measure absolute cerebral blood flow. Um, you have DSC, which we use a lot for tumors, right, so it's negative contrast from the first pass of gadolinium, and you look at relative cerebral blood uh, volume, and then dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, which is T1 weighted we do this a lot with like breast and liver, for example, or research in the brain. And it's T1 weighted. So now you're looking at positive contrast to GAD. But the thing is that not just the first pass, but over time, right? Um, GAD will actually partition from the intravascular space where you injected it to the interstitial space, right? And so that partition coefficient, looking at that exchange can be very helpful for glymphatic function. And so actually all three of these, you have to repurpose them for glymphatic uh, applications, but all three of these can actually be used to help look at that. So in terms of, this was a very well-known study um, on actually clinical patients, right? Where they looked at um, just GAD injection and then they actually re-imaged them three uh, and 24 hours post, uh, post, uh, post injection. And so you can see how um, that initial, um, the initial intravenous injection actually partitions out into the CSF and then even into, you know, um, the, the globes, right? The vitreous humor and so forth and so on. And here's a closer look, right? So initially it's actually the aqueous humor and later the vitreous humor, right? Over time. Uh, you can see um, other things like the, the cavernous sinuses, you can see the inner ears and so forth. So there's a time dependent um, uh, entry, right? Uh, exchange of uh, with, with different barriers, uh, time dependent, and then eventually clearance, but it's all very uh, dynamic and temporal and different for each barrier system. Um, the cord plexus, as I mentioned, right? That's the, um, that's the blood CSF barrier. So normal, normal cord plexus is very hypervascular. It's like five, six times more perfused than normal brain parenchyma on ASL. And then obviously a papilloma or, or um, 
carcinoma, right, is even more like dysplastic, right? So this is actually an atypical one because it's getting some left meningeal seeding, but you can see the high amount of flow that's happening. So on ASL, um, there have been many studies looking at, you know, the, the normal uh, increased perfusion of the cord plexus and even alterations in like dementia and so forth. And you can also look at the um, things like the proton concentration. This is uh, essentially amide proton imaging, so looking at how much protein there is. And so uh, in a papilloma, there's, you know, increased protein, and then in the carcinoma, there's even more. So again, it just depends on what you're really trying to look for. What's your clinical question? Um, in terms of uh, different uh, types of tumors, right? So normally we use the DSC, but you can actually use any perfusion technique. They just measure slightly different things. So uh, this is helpful for surgeons in terms of staging, right? Making sure they don't under biopsy when they're, when they're trying to uh, assess the tumor. So this was a PXA. Uh, this was... Um, actually an infantile ganglioglioma, right? But again, you're really looking at these areas of increased perfusion. And this was a glioblastoma. So, so you can actually see all of the different exchange constants in the brain. So you can use this to look at blood perfusion. You can use this to look at CSF perfusion. It just depends on how you're setting your parameters and so forth. So work with your physicist. Um, and then IVIM is actually just a form of diffusion where we do both low and high B values. So normally you do diffusion weighted imaging um, at high B values, right? And so you're looking at random molecular water diffusion, but there's actually a small component from the blood microcirculation, which actually forms a pseudo diffusion coefficient. So if you actually measure low B values as well, like multiple B values, you can actually do this exponential correction and do a more standardized or corrected thing for clinical trials. And so you can um, normalize things to look at, um, you know, corrected ADC, uh, kurtosis, et cetera, um, and actually uh, develop a normalized index that looks at both perfusion and diffusion characteristics. So you can imagine how this would be very helpful for serial, you know, tumor imaging, post-treatment, et cetera. Um, here's a nice uh, example from Danny Wong, who does a lot of Alzheimer work uh, over at USC, um, Loney. So um, here he's looking at amyloid beta in the CSF, right? And so basically the more, you, because amyloid beta is bad, right? It can form like a fibrils and plaques in the brain. So if you're clearing it, that means your lymphatic function is better, right? So they, they correlated the CSF um, uh, levels of amyloid beta. And so they correlated with higher overall cerebral blood flow and higher overall blood brain permeability. So basically the better the glymphatic function, the better the exchange and flow, the healthier the brain was. So the neuropsychiatric outcomes were also better. Um, here's another thing with APOE. So APOE basically uh, is helping you to remove your, you know, your plaques and stuff. And so if you have the APOE uh, four, uh, mutation, uh, heterozygous or even worse, homozygous, right? It's a poor outcome. So here he was showing that essentially the mutational load of APOE4 correlated with poorer, you know, uh, blood brain barrier permeability. So worse lymphatic function. Uh, there was increased iron deposition in the brain. So worse neurodegeneration, uh, decreased iron removal, right? Toxin removal, and then increased amyloid plaques on the Pittsburgh BP uh, PET. Um, this is a nice work from Jun Hua, right? So if you do a post-contrast T1, right? You can do this on any patient, right? Everything will light up all the vessels. Um, and somewhere in here are those meningeal lymphatics I told you about. Uh, but you can't tell them apart from the vessels because everything's enhancing. If you do a post-contrast flare, so this is a post-contrast CD flare, um, you suppress the vessels, but you actually see the surrounding meningeal lymphatics. So these are those parasagittal dural lymphatics, meningeal lymphatics I told you about. So these are the ones that communicate uh, with the uh, sagittal sinus and actually are able to drain out to the cervical lymphatic. So you can see them actually quite nicely. And so John actually did a DSC study to actually um, quantify the exchange, um, you know, during a GAD, like first pass of GAD to actually look at different types of disease processes and show that, you know, drop in signal with the GAD injection within the meningeal lymphatics to show the, the essentially the healthiness of the lymphatic system. Um, you can also look at, you know, just normal disease process. So this was actually a patient uh, we saw at my institution with COVID-19 who had retinitis. So these kind of like, you know, um, ill-defined sort of nodular fluffy deposits uh, are, are characteristic of COVID-19 retinitis. There's a paper in radiology. And again, this is the vitreous humor, right? So essentially the blood retinal barrier has been broken down and you're getting these inflamed like plaque-like deposits. Uh, here's a labyrinthitis case. So again, like normally your inner ear should have nice CSF signal, right? But that has been uh, broken down, right, by this middle ear infection, right? So we have meningogenic labyrinthitis. And so now you're getting enhancement. And this can actually um, sometimes ossify out, right? Um, here's the classic neuromyelitis optica, right? So the aquaporin-4 autoimmunity leads to these patchy, sometimes, you know, cloudy enhancement. 
all along the ventricular system because that's where the appendum and the you know the blood brain blood uh, appendable barriers are right so all those transport processes are degenerating so you get a lot of like fluffy ill-defined peri um, ventricular type uh, cloudy things and also characteristic of the um, as I mentioned the uh, aeropostrema right uh, in the back of the third uh, sorry back of the fourth and um, and then you can also have like some uh, cord stuff like just patchy cord things especially along that central canal right everything's kind of like along that appendable lining central canal um, everything's kind of the permeation is happening with those faulty aquaporin four channels. And then here's a so the, your brachial plexus. So outside of the dorsal root ganglion, your your um, your peripheral nerve should have enhanced, right? So this is a case where it's like a Parsonage Turner, right? And essentially like post viral, and then they had like some uh, you know pair infectious like issues with the brachial plexus. So um, you're getting blood nerve barrier breakdown, and so you have enhancement and edema in the brachial plexus. Um, and then for DCE, right, this is a, a well-known patient who was like in the news and stuff with a face transplant. And out of interest, you know, I wanted to see what the kind of exchange processes were. So uh, we did DCE and you could see, you know, whenever you, basically they, they replanted this mid-face, right? So the, si the sinus, you know, once you uh, break the, you know, break the connections, like those, those cilia of the sinuses are never going to be like normal anymore. So there's a lot of, you know, um, retention cysts and whatnot, but uh, the vessels hook up. And then in terms of the drainage, there is some third spacing as you would expect with a transplant, but the perfusion to the flap is good. And here you can kind of see the drainage and everything in the exchange to the cervical lymphatic. So basically the facial things are draining in the cervical lymphatic. So all of this is, is basically hooking up. Uh, and then we have uh, MR lymphangiography, right? So this is a poor child with a very extensive head and neck lymphatic malformation, as you can see. And then there was some actually, you know, leakage uh, happening, you know, leakage and exchange uh, through these disorganized cervical lymphatics, right? So as they were coming down, right, there was a lot of leak into the lymphatics and the thoracic duct and so forth. And so uh, you can inject either, you know, nodes like in the cervical region or in the groin, depending on what you're looking for. You're looking for peripheral, you're looking for cervical. But the idea is that you can actually image uh, lymphatic flow, you know, in the cervi uh, cervical lymphatics in the periphery over time as well, if you're looking for downstream, uh, downstream flow. So again, it's all about what's your clinical question. How do you want to characterize it? Work with your physicist to tailor those techniques based on the you know, underlying mechanisms. So my last slide, you know, the idea is that we have all of these complex, um, you know, processes all the way from cellular molecular, all the way to organ systems, which we typically do with radiology and then population health, right? And we interrogate these through a combination of ideally quantitative techniques, right? Our, our radiology, digital pathologies coming down the pike, a lot of genomic, epigenomic stuff, and then uh, clinical metrics and lab values. And ideally, we all work together to synthesize this information. So it essentially um, allows us to provide earlier, more accurate disease diagnosis, risk assessment and prognosis, and then targeted therapies, right? So minimally invasive interventions, molecular therapeutics, so forth and so on, to optimize our long-term patient outcomes. And that's really the vision of precision health. And uh, so, you know, into the future, right? So I talked about 7T. There are actually a few systems out there um, which are above 10T, right? And they're mostly scanning like animals and fruits and stuff right now, not human stuff. But the idea of these, right, is that um, you can bridge the micro scale and the macro scale to really achieve what we call the meso scale, right? So uh, we will have the ability to look at cellular molecular level processes and then link them through brain systems, brain networks to really understand the underpinnings of neurologic and psychiatric disorders at a much higher level than we currently do. And I think the lymphatic system plays a huge, huge role in that. And these sorts of um, technologies will be required to interrogate them. So in conclusion, a glymphatic system with many barrier systems helps to regulate the brain homeostasis via selective fluid exchange between different stereotyped compartments. Neurofluid circulation varies quite a bit physiologically, right? So there's a lot of normal variation but it can also be disrupted by diseases and interventions, right? So we can use this to help optimize our therapies, but also various diseases can create uh, insults that lead to a final common path. We have a glymphedema. And multimodal imaging, various things that I showed in terms of flow, structure, and function can be tailored to help us provide quantitative characterization for targeted diagnosis and treatment in various disorders. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions now. Dr. Ho, we have a couple questions, and I can start us off by reading the first one to you. I thought fungal meningitis gets to perivascular VR spaces because there's some connection to the subarachnoid space. 
What is the mechanism of cryptococcal gelatinous pseudocyst? That's a great question. So um, I agree. Um, macroscopically, you do see a lot of like, you know, thick nodular, you know, fungal type meningitides in basilar. So you, you often will see them basilar, right? Like um, because they're heavy, right? And they deposit and there's a lot of more flow around the basilar cisterns. Um, so with the with the pseudocyst, essentially, they're very like sticky and, you know, gelatinous. And you see some you see something like this, too, with, for example, um, mucopolysaccharidosis, right? So that's basically the glycosaminoglycans, right? And they accumulate, and they actually accumulate in the perivascular spaces and swell them. And so the glymphatics fail first there. But then if you think about something like metachromatic leukodystrophy, where, you know, like all of the, like all of the myelin is, is dystrophic, but then the, uh, the CSF is okay, you actually have this tigroid pattern where you have preservation of brain around the perivascular spaces and everything else is affected. So you're absolutely right. I think from a macroscopic standpoint, I'm sure that over time those things can leak and, and they would impair the uh, pericapillary space exchange as well. And I'm sure that actually probably contributes if someone wanted to do a study of, you know, what is the, are there more parenchymal deposits like beta amyloid or whatnot in a chronic crypto case. But I think you're right. It's like, basically it's a primary CSF process. There's a lot of, you know, sticky, you know, gelatinous infection kind of in and around, you know, the basal cisterns and later the subarachnoid spaces and crawls into the perivascular spaces. But you're absolutely right that over time that could have, you know, secondary effects on the parenchymal drainage as well. So it's all about, you know, where does the disease process start? And then how does that affect glymphatic drainage, you know, on top of everything else? Awesome. Our next question is, do we all leak CSF into our sinuses in very small amounts through the cribiform plate? And if so, do we have an idea of the normal rates? And could that be a non-invasive measure of CSF movement? So that's a great question. So I was actually just at a skull base meeting um, with a surgeon who mentioned that the, he had a patient who didn't have any defect, but was leaking, like had beta transferrin going through. So yes, we do all leak normal amounts. Um, and uh, there was a rat study F, um, that talked about this. And I think they they fed them something and then it, it, they, they measured it in their nose. So we definitely all do because there are these normal, you know, um, uh, foramina for the, through the olfactory groove and you do get drainage that. The problem is that I think everyone varies. Obviously, some people have like the very thin, you know, olfactory plates and some people have CSF leaks, you know, from like little dehiscences. And then maybe if you had your COVID swab up there, you would actually create an iatrogenic one and so forth and so on. So it's definitely a normal variant, but like, I don't think anyone knows what the kind of the threshold is for calling, you know, normal versus abnormal. But I think it also depends on whether you can see the discrete bone defect or not. But uh, some people have more foramina, some people have larger foramina, you know, some people have less. So I there's, there's clearly going to be a normal amount of variation. So it is one factor for sure. And maybe could even have implications in terms of, uh, you know, like CSF hypotension and other types of symptoms. I think there are some like migraine nerves and things, uh, or some people with like CNS infection who have had more leakage. Um, the only problem is it's not, it's not a going to be a direct, or it's only one factor, right, in the overall CSF dynamics. If you're looking at overall CSF dynamics, there are many other things, but this particular drainage pathway is just one of many. So I absolutely agree that for a targeted research project, and maybe in correlation with either normal variation or disease processes, or maybe let's say patients who you're doing the myelogram and you want to see, you know, what, um, ev like if they have no bone defect, but they still have symptoms of CSF hypotension, I'd be really interested to see. I bet we do have some patients who have maybe just like more patchless foramina or something like that. So I think it'd be very interesting. A Kiros, you know, classification, like how does all of that correlate? But yeah, it is a normal variant and there's still a lot we don't know about it. Do you think that the time slip MRI sequence has any utility in the study of the glymphatic system? Yeah, that's a great question. So time slip is basically a version of phase contrast, you know, so non-contrast flow. And so it could be used, right? You just have to work with your physicist to understand, you know, what's the question, like which part of the brain or central nervous system are you wanting to measure the CSF flow or exchange and then figuring out the directionality because you have, do have to set, you know, like a vank in a direction. So I think, um, and there's also like 2D, 3D, 4D, even 5D for a cardiac flow now, right? So each of these has like pros and cons. And so it's just a measure, it's just a matter of, you know, what kind of volunteers or disease process are you looking at? What do you want to show? Where do you want to show it? You know, in what direction you want to show it? And then having your physicists work out those kinks. But absolutely, it's one of the many techniques that has been used, particularly in Japan. There's a lot of papers on it. Uh, one final question. Um, I want to do a research about the spread of PVS in the brain, patients with migraine. How can I measure them? What program do you recommend? 
This is a good question. So there's not, I know there's a few papers in the literature about, I think, institutions that have done like the deep learning, you know, machine learning auto segmentation. If you're not doing it at 70, I think it would be very hard. I mean, I guess you could do a Fiesta or something, but that takes a long time and there could be artifacts. So I would say from a practical standpoint, what a lot of people have done is just have ratings, like radiologist ratings to so say like, you know, number, you could even do ordinal ratings. So like, you know, um, like few, many, you know, for, for age or whatever, you could say like, you know, small, moderate, large, and like how many there are or something like that. But clearly there are qualitative changes we see as well. It's just that it's easier um, to quantify these, you know, by auto segmentation automatically, but you need kind of like a nice high resolution sequence, 3D sequence and 7T, which we often don't get. So if you're looking at something like migraine, again, this is challenging because there are a lot of reasons people get migraines, right? It could be like vasculopathy, blah, blah, blah. But let's say you're excluding you know, all of the other causes. So you're talking about like idiopathic migraine, and then you want to talk about the subtypes of migraine, but you need some normal controls and you need the migraineurs, and maybe you'd even want to follow them, you know, pre-post uh, treatment and like how long have they been, what are their symptoms? So there's a lot of, I think, clinical trial design issues you'd have to think about first, but ultimately in terms of the PVS question, right, I think you could get ordinal raters and be just fine for your conventional imaging. Hey, Dr. Ho, I lied. There's one more question. Yeah. Okay. You ready for it? Okay. Yes. Can you comment on the relation between the lymphatic system and multiple sclerosis? Yeah, so multiple sclerosis, I talked more about NMO just because of the aquaporin form thing, but you're absolutely right. I think multiple sclerosis is another one. I mean, there's a there's a kind of theorized like viral, you know, potentially viral aspect to that now too. But absolutely, you know, inflammatory changes just like with infection, right? So autoimmune disorders do involve some level of disturbed barrier function, right? And I think with MS, there's some other um, clearly there's like that perivenular sign. So, you know, there are the perivenular, the myeline plaque. So clearly there is some aspect of glymphatic function slash dysfunction involved in there. I think we understand less about that. And we also are wondering, you know, what are the other, you know, underlying uh, viral slash autoimmune etiologies. But I, I totally agree that uh, autoimmune slash inflammatory conditions also um, are implicated. And there are a number of papers on MS and disturbed glymphatic, disturbed sleep. I just don't think they've made as clear of a connection as with NMO or some of the other disorders. And maybe that's an area that, you know, you could start looking into, but, but I'm sure there will be factors. You could even look at something like the ALPS index. The only problem is that, um, right, the MS lesions are everywhere, right? So you can't, there's not really a control, but let's say for early MS, maybe you'd be able to, uh, let, let's say like um, for a patient who at the level of Centrum Somia Valley, right, maybe in an area where there is an MS lesion doing the ALPS index versus the contralateral area where there's not, you know, like an early MS, we might be able to find differences. So I think you you should be able to um, demonstrate theoretically disturbed lymphatic function there as well. I think that the the tiny lesions and the global disease burden have limited a lot of the, you know, um, research applications in that area, but I'm quite sure that you would be able to demonstrate some findings as well. Awesome. Dr. Ho, thanks for answering all those questions. And thank you so much for your lecture today. And thanks for everyone for participating in our new conference and a special thanks to our co-sponsor, AAWR. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. Be sure to join us next Thursday, March 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern for a live case review from Dr. Mahan Mather on imaging of uncommon GIGU disorders. You can register at MRI online, follow us on social media for updates for future noon conferences as well. Thanks again and have a great day.